Hello and welcome to Business Incorporated. I am BC at Debayo. Coming up on the show today. Nigeria's inflation jumps to 13.22% year on year in August. UK's unemployment rate rises by 4.1% in July. And Control Risk and NKC African Economists launch fifth edition of the Africa Risk Reward Index. Let's begin the show with Nigeria's inflation, which rose by 0.4% to 13.22% year on year in August from July's 12.82%, with increases recorded in all divisions. Data released by the National Bureau of Statistics shows that on a monthly basis, the headline index increased to 1.34% in August from 1.25%. Core inflation rose to 0. Or rose 0.42% to 10.52% in the month under review from 10.1% recorded previously. Food inflation was higher at 16% in August, and that was due to increases in the price of bread and cereals, potatoes, yam and other tubers, meat and fish, among others. The urban inflation rate increased to 13.83% year-on-year from 13.4% while the rural inflation rate rose to 12.65% in August from 12.28%. Well, let's take a look at intraday market numbers now. And Nigeria's main index was the only laggard among the markets we track. The index declined marginally by 0.06%, while South Africa's DSE jumped 0.37%. In Egypt, the EGX30 advanced 0.12% and Kenya closed negative on Monday. But for major markets in the Gulf region, they were mostly positive at intraday, except Abu Dhabi's index, which declined 0.14%. And Dubai's main index was higher today by 0.47%, also at intraday. And elsewhere in the region, Saudi Arabia's index advanced 0.66%, while the Qatari index added 0.20%. And in other markets, talking about Asia now, stocks were mostly higher today as investors watched China's August economic data released earlier in the day. Well, mainland Chinese stocks edged higher by the close with the Shanghai Composite up 0.51%, while the Shenzhen component advanced 0.93%. Hong Kong's Hanzeng Index gained 0.32% as at its final hour of trading. South Korea's Kospi finished its trading day 0.65% higher, while Australia's S&P ASX 200 closed fractionally lower at 5,894.8. Japanese stocks also declined as the Nikkei 225 slipped 0.44% and the Topics Index shed 0.62%. And in Europe, stocks were mixed this morning as investors shifted their focus to upcoming central bank meetings by the U.S. Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan and the Bank of England. We're joining me to give a sense of what else is happening today in the European market is Chelsea Delaney. Good afternoon, Chelsea. German car maker Daimler has agreed to pay $1.5 billion to settle emissions cheating allegations in the United States. So, so far, uh, the, the Mercedes-Benz parent has been hit with much smaller penalties than Volkswagen. Could that change? So, so far, this is definitely the biggest penalty that Daimler has faced for its involvement in these emissions uh, cheating scandals that have been uh, termed Dieselgate. Uh, so 1.5 billion euros is quite large, and Daimler has set aside uh, about 5 to 6 billion euros to cover potential losses from these legal settlements around the world. That's still much, much lower than what Volkswagen has paid over the past couple of years. Volkswagen, which was really the first company to become embroiled in this scandal, has paid more than 30 billion euros uh, over the past couple of years to uh, settle uh, ac class action lawsuits, to settle criminal charges, to settle, credit, uh, to, to settle civil charges all around the world. Um, and and that the main reason why Volkswagen has, has paid so much is because they have had a lot more cars involved in, in this scandal. So the number of, of vehicles uh, that were affected with these emissions cheating devices was about 11 million. 
globally for Volkswagen. For Daimler, it's uh, about a million they've estimated, so it's a, a much smaller pool of vehicles that have been affected. Um, but Daimler is still facing a lot of cases, and it will take a very long time for these um, for these lawsuits to, to be settled. They're still facing potential criminal charges in the United States. They're still facing lawsuits here in Germany and Canada and the UK, really all over the world. And so they, they still are, <clears throat> are certainly having to, uh, to account for um, their involvement in, in the, the emissions uh, cheating scandal at the same time as they're also really s struggling financially with the after effects of the coronavirus and, and, and the shift to electric vehicles. All right, Chelsea, you know, next up is the fact that Chinese President Xi Jinping met with EU Commission head yesterday to discuss an investment pact six years in the making. Are the two sides any closer to a deal? What we've heard uh, from the EU Commission head, Ursula von der Leyen, is that they still have a lot of big issues to work out. Um, this potential investment deal has, as you said, been in the works for about six years. The negotiations really fell apart at the start of the year over some issues related to uh, China's climate goals um, and, and also some other factors related to uh, the opening of Chinese markets for investors in, uh, from Europe. So it, they had fallen apart and, and over the past couple of months we'd heard more from EU and Chinese officials. They wanted to really strike a deal by the end of the year. Um, there's a lot of pressure on both sides to seal this investment pact. Uh, on the one hand, you have China, which is really struggling uh, in seeing the resurgence in, in trade uncertainties with the United States. And here in Europe, um, there's also trade uncertainties with the United States. And, and for Europe, um, the they really need uh, a strong trading partner in, in China right now. So uh, there certainly are a, a lot of reasons why they want to be striking this deal. But from what we heard yesterday from EU officials is that they still are, for one, quite concerned about human rights violations in China, the, the oppression of Muslims, uh, the, the crackdown on, on Hong Kong. Those are issues they, they want to, to have discussed further. And they also uh, just aren't quite convinced that investors are going to be well enough protected in China. So still a lot of big, difficult issues to, to work through before they, they get closer to a trade deal. One last question, Chelsea, and that's that data out of China continues to show that the country's economy is rebounding. Why is China recovering faster than much of the world? Well, the recovery in the Chinese economy has actually been pretty uh, astonishing over the past couple of months. China was obviously the first place to, to really get hit with the, the coronavirus. Um, that means they are ahead of most countries in, uh, in, in terms of dealing with the after effects of, of the virus. Um, but they really have been quite successful in cracking or on and containing the virus. And that's in part due to the really aggressive measures they took, the mass testing, the surveillance. Other, uh, other Western democracies couldn't really take the same steps and, and have had a much more difficult time controlling the actual virus. So in Wuhan, which was the, the center of the outbreak in China, they haven't had a new case in about three months now. Um, so that's definitely helped the economy. Uh, and at the same time, we have started to see things like government stimulus um, uh, really driving uh, uh, support for the industrial side of, of the economy. So China is definitely doing better than any other developed uh, economy right now. They're the only developed, major developed economy that's expected to grow this year, which really is just underscoring how important it is for, for economies like the EU to maintain these trade contacts with China because they're really the only place that seems to be really having a strong economy right now. Oh, I do hope that the growth continues to trickle down to other economies of the world. Thank you, Chelsea. We'll see you again tomorrow. Well, let's see how the markets in the UK are reacting to the latest unemployment data. And Juliana Olayinka would be telling us. Good afternoon, Juliana. So we've seen the young people mostly hit as unemployment rates rises to 4.1%. What sound bites are you getting from the authorities regarding this data? And what are the market numbers saying at the moment in reaction to this? 
Got to tell you, Bissy, not much sound bites uh, coming out of the British government uh, this morning about the latest unemployment figures. It stands at 4.1% for the three months uh, to July. And I think that's really uh, because historically and internationally, this is still a pretty low figure. We have seen that 700,000 jobs have come off the payroll in this country since the start of the pandemic. But again, this is just the start. This is uh, kind of looking back in the rearview mirror. This isn't looking at what's to come. And we all know or we're all expecting a tsunami of job cuts uh, by the end of October when this job subsidy scheme, the furlough scheme or the retention scheme comes to an end. I've got to tell you, the sentiment appears to have come overnight. First of all, from China, we have those industrial figures that suggest that potentially uh, the world's second largest economy may return to pre-COVID growth before the end of the year. And of course, there was that uh, historic uh, Commons vote yesterday, uh, which determined that the internal markets bill will be going into a second reading. So the FTSE All Share at Intraday is up 0.75%. The FTSE 100 is up by 0.86%. And the FTSE 250 is up by 0.43% in currencies. Pound is also up on the US dollar by 0.48%, up on the euro by 0.20%, and up on the Japanese yen by 0.40%. All right, Juliana. Now, Labour leader Keir Starmer, in a speech to union leaders later today, is expected to call on Boris Johnson to replace the fallen scheme and outlaw firing and rehiring practices. How do you see that uh, actually playing out? Oh, goodness me. Uh, Boris Johnson has got so much on his plate at the moment. But, you know, we've been discussing this at great length on this programme over the past couple of weeks. The calls are uh, climbing for uh, Chancellor Rishi Shunak to extend the furlough scheme. And those calls were reiterated again by Sir Keir Starmer, the uh, Labour leader at the TUC annual conference. Um, this conference is the first time, of course, that it's been taking place remotely. And it comes at a backdrop of uh, rising job cuts and, of course, these intensifying Brexit talks. Uh, Sir Keir Starmer is actually self-isolating at the moment. I discussed this yesterday uh, because a member of his household is actually showing symptoms of COVID-19. We're not sure yet whether he's got them, but he did call on uh, Boris Johnson not to uh, just give away with the furlough scheme at the end of the year. He's asked for the government to work alongside with him and alongside with business leaders and union members to try and craft out a sector by sector uh, schemes that can help prevent this tsunami of unemployment, which uh, by no means every uh, kind of serious business leader in the UK has uh, been talking about. I'll just read a very brief part of one of his comments. He says, we all know the furlough, furlough scheme can't go on as it is forever, but the truth is the virus is still with us and infections are rising. It just isn't possible to get back to work or reopen businesses. It isn't a choice. It's the cold reality of this crisis. So it makes no sense at all for the government to pull away support in one full swoop. Uh, that's what he said earlier this morning. So the pressures are growing uh, for Rishi Shunak to either adopt uh, some sort of policy where part time work can be more acceptable or as well. Uh, we have seen in places like Germany and France um, them deciding the government's deciding to extend it on a two year uh, basis by subsidising the amount of hours employees are working or focusing on sectors that are badly hit, like the aviation industry, the hospitality industry and retail. All right, Juliana, we talked about the sale of ARM holdings to US NVIDIA. Now, the government is under pressure to intervene in the $40 billion takeover of the UK's biggest tech company. Has the government said anything about this? We haven't heard anything from the government yet. Again, Boris Johnson's intro is pretty full, but it's a major story and it is uh, causing uh, much concern, not just for uh, ARM's co-founder who said yesterday that, you know, selling this to America when America is in the, in the midst of a trade spat with China would be absolutely ridiculous. ARM's was actually sold to a Japanese company about four years ago, but its headquarters remains in the UK in Cambridge, and they have over two and a half thousand staff. Uh, Arms have a monopoly on uh, chip um, hardware and software. They have over 95% uh, of the main players purchase their chips from Arm Holdings. It's seen as the most successful technology company to ever be built out of the UK. And there are major concerns as to why uh, Britain would allow this to be sold uh, to America when they can really use this as a bargaining tool, particularly as uh, the talks with the EU are getting 
pretty desperate. There are suggestions that Oliver Dowding, the culture secretary, uh, will be speaking with the CMA, the Competition and Markets Authority, and asking them to examine this very carefully. And like I said, lots of observers and commentators, particularly actually the Labour opposition party, are urging Prime Minister Boris Johnson to intervene to make sure right. that arms holdings remains in the UK. All right, Juliana, thank you. We'll see you again tomorrow. We'll talk about Sudan's inflation when we return in just a moment. Do stay with us. Welcome back. Sudan's annual inflation surged by 23.05% to 166.83% in August from 143.78% in July, driven by increases in the price of food and transportation. Data from the state statistics office shows that the main upward pressure came from prices of food and fuels aggravated by weeks-long virus lockdown measures. Sudan declared an economic state of emergency last week Thursday after its currency fell sharply and set up special courts to prosecute what officials called a systemic operation to vandalize the economy. Leading global specialist risk consultancy, Control Risk, and NKC African Economists, the Africa-focused subsidiary of Oxford Economists, has launched the fifth edition of the Africa Risk Reward Index. The Africa Risk Reward Index plots each country's performance relative to its African peers by comparing some of the continent's largest and emerging markets, offering investors a comparative snapshot of market opportunities and risk across Africa. A partner West Africa journalist at Control Risk, Tim Cox, joins us now to tell us more about this year's index. Good afternoon, Mr. Cox. Thank you for joining us on the program. Now, tell us about the Africa Risk Reward Index and what it seeks to achieve. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon. Great to be here. Um, so we're very excited about this, which is our, our fifth edition of the Ask Africa Risk Reward Index. And, and what this does, is it takes uh, a number of political and economic factors. We, we weight 11 key metrics. And together with our partners at NKC African Economics, we assign these scores based upon our understanding of, of the operating environments and based upon the econometric data that, that we analyze. And what the, this gives us is a, a snapshot for investors who can then make better informed decisions about where their particular risk appetite sits based upon the, the, re, the relative reward or the relative risk upon investing in any given economy. Now, this is the fifth edition of the publication and the first since the advent of COVID-19. What are the key findings as it concerns Africa? Yes, indeed. And of course, this year's edition is dominated by COVID-19 and the impact that it has had on economies across the continent. I think the first thing to say is that the highlight of this year's report is really a low light in that the, the reward rating for all of the economies that, that we include within this index fell, some of them quite significantly. And that is, large, that is mainly a result of the impact of COVID-19 um, across both the formal and informal sectors of, of these economies. So a significant impact. It also reverses a four-year trend, which we have seen previously, which has been a steady increase in, in the aggregate reward ratings for the economies that we looked at. Oh, the risk ratings were... Say, Go say ahead, again, Mr. Cox, you were saying something. Yeah, so the, the risk rating is slightly more nuanced and complicated with some fallers and some gainers. But by and large, um, COVID has been the key narrative and, and the ability for the economies to bounce back and reverse that record flight of capital away from emerging markets that we've witnessed over the last year is what we're really focusing on going forwards. All right. Now, we'd like to know where are countries such as Nigeria and Ghana in all of these? Well, both Nigeria and Ghana are hugely important economies, um, not just within West Africa, but, but on a continental scale. Um, they are both modest fallers, so the reward, um, reward index has dropped slightly and, and the risk has increased slightly. And that leaves them both relatively equally matched in terms of a, an aggregate reward score. Uh, but certainly Nigeria is, is further towards the riskier end of the spectrum in that regard. But it's worth oh. noting that, that our aim here isn't to create uh, a league table um, or, or indeed to be um, 
to be comparative in a negative sense. What we're looking to do here is identify those countries and those economies which match differing investors' risk appetites. Some of that Nigeria, even though it's a bit higher risk than Ghana, according to our scales, offers tremendous reward opportunities based upon its demographics, based upon its, its economic diversity. And so that's, that's where we're pitching this at. For one investor, that might be the right market. For another, Ghana may be preferable. Now, no one saw COVID-19 coming, but then what recommendation does this proffer to African governments towards tackling the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, well, as we've said, I mean, COVID-19 dominates this year's report and it is a hugely important issue. I, I think there are three things that, that African governments can look at doing as they, they transition out of this pandemic phase into the recovery phase. The first is to be very clear and transparent about the communications and, and invest in getting the right data um, and getting that data out to the, the various stakeholders that need to hear it. Too often we see obfuscation or we see attempts to, to bury unwelcome headlines. And ultimately all that does is generate further uncertainty, which we, we know is a major spook to investors. So while um, we certainly cannot downplay the importance of this crisis, it has been hugely significant, both on an economic and on a, on a personal level. It is very important to look to, know, look to the future and to recognise that this will change. Which brings me to the second point, which is where African governments can help their economies to, to restart. And we've seen a big focus on tech, particularly tech and digitalization of the older sectors of the economy, things like agriculture and extractives, helping to solve problems and bring new innovations and new solutions to long-standing issues that those sectors have faced. And, and finally, there is an opportunity in the adversity to capitalize upon a, a a greater than usual public tolerance for implementing some reforms that might not be terribly popular. We're seeing this um, in Nigeria at the moment with the downstream energy sector and also mooted reforms around aviation and telecoms. Really important that, that this opportunity, this very narrow window of opportunity is used to help push through some of those reforms, narrow the fiscal base and leave those governments better placed to capitalise upon the resurgence as and when it comes. We would like to thank you, Partner West Africa Generalist at Control Risk, Mr. Tim Cox, for uh, speaking with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Let's talk about oil prices now. They actually slipped in early trade today as worries over slow recovery in global fuel demand were reinforced by warnings by major oil producers about short covering ahead of a meeting later this week of OPEC and its allies' limited losses. Brent crude was down 0.1% at $39.56 a barrel, while US WTI were down 0.1% at $37.23 a barrel. Both contracts ended slightly lower the previous day. Major oil industry producers and traders are forecasting a bleak future for worldwide fuel demand due to the pandemic's ongoing assault on the global economy with OPEC downgrading its oil demand forecast and BP sites in demand might have peaked in 2019. Gold hit a near two-week high earlier today as the dollar weakened and investors turned their focus to a U.S. Federal Reserve monetary policy meeting seeking details of how it planned to hold down rates while aiming to boost inflation. Spot gold was up 0.5% at 1000 $966.47 an ounce, while U.S. gold futures climbed 0.7% to $1,976.9. Among other precious metals, platinum rose 0.6% at $960.21 an ounce, and silver gained 1% uh, at $27.44, and palladium eased 0.1% to $2,311.78 an ounce. That's our program today. Thank you for watching IMBC Adebayo.